Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I am an accountant. And today, I uh, and have a bit of a sore throat, so can you still hear me if I use this? Is that okay? Okay. So, today I'm going to, uh, let's I'm looking at the ages in the audience here. I'm going to be a little bit like Donnie and Marie Osmond. A little bit country, a little bit rock and roll, a little bit accountant, a little bit entrepreneur. Okay? So, I want to talk about um, two very important things. One is... Uh, very accountant and one is very entrepreneur. So these are practical, hands-on uh, things you can take in and do immediately. So first, let's dig in. What keeps most business owners up at night? <laughs> Interactive, you can say something. Yeah. Cash or lack thereof, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's right. You're going to hear the cash is king mantra quite a bit, I think, today. Because it is. It's critically important how we use it. <coughs> the health of a business depends on healthy cash flow. So as an accountant, this is where we always start. What's happening with our cash flow? Okay, where are we getting money? Where are we spending money? In your packets, uh, because it might get a little small on the screen, or maybe it's exactly right on the screen, um, and a little small in your handouts. This is a cash flow forecast. This is how we start. I'm going to go through this line by line. It doesn't matter if you have a business that's doing $1,500 a month, $15,000 a month, or $15 million a month. This is critical. Cash flow forecast is critical. First line, we start with your beginning balance, how much you have in the bank right now after you do your checks. The second line, where is our money coming from? Obviously our clients. This is the art in the cash flow, okay? You've got to understand the timing of your clients. Some of our customers have uh, a, a couple of really big clients, and they actually list those clients because they understand, you know, we work with Target. It'd be great if they paid us in 30, but they pay us in 75 or whatever that is, illustratively Target. But so you want to make sure that you're listing it out. Then we list all the payments that have a drop dead deadline. And by this I mean if we don't pay it by a certain date, something bad happens. If we don't pay our health insurance by the 10th of the following month, we're going to get cut off. If we don't pay our employees, they're going to walk out the door. If we don't pay Uncle Sam the taxes we owe him, well, debtor's prison no longer exists, but we still have trouble when that happens, right? So all of those things, we plug them into the days that they're due, the weeks that they're due. Everything else goes into this line, general overhead. That's your God forbid account. I hate getting not, not getting paid, but I'm not going to kill you if you don't pay me two days late. It's okay. Um, your accountant, your lawyer, your membership dues, all of those things that have a little wiggle room in the actual date. And here's why we're doing this. You want this bottom line number. <coughs> Anytime you hit the brackets, that's bad. Right? You want to know when you're going to hit the brackets so you can manage to that. So here we're going to hit the brackets $9,000. Huh, maybe the week before we're not going to spend $12,000 in general overhead expenses. Maybe we're only going to spend two or three so we have money here. Because here is payroll. Right? Now, just because you can see that you have a $9,000 problem or a $14,000 problem and you can temporarily avoid it, that does not mean you've solved it. So if you continually are living in the brackets and you are just borrowing from Peter to pay Paul or holding off on that expense you can pay your employees, you still have a problem. We had a client that started a few weeks ago and I sat down with him once all the client launch stuff was down and we had his cash flow up and running and he said, love this cash flow, it's become a sacred text for me, I read it every week like it's, the, it's my own personal Bible. But here's the thing, three or four weeks out, we're always $15,000 short. Always. But it never comes to pass. I mean, we never don't make payroll. We never don't pay some of our bills. I mean, it just never comes to pass. So is that never real or... And first, I'm going to tell you the very first thing we did when he asked that is we looked at our assumptions here. The deposits from customers. Because again, garbage in, garbage out. We said, yep, those numbers are right. That's why you're often... We're pretty good. But the thing is, you have a $15,000 hole. You're managing around it, but you have not generated enough profit to fill that hole. You've got to generate an additional $15,000 of cash permanently without spending it on the next thing to fill it. 
Make sense? So this is the very first thing we do because it suddenly makes everything clear. Do we have enough? Do we continually have too little? Or we just have stop short gaps? Questions on this at all? Because the next thing I'm going to do. What about startups? Maybe yep, I think this is even important. more important for startups. They have to understand. I mean, there, <laughs> there, these numbers are smaller, typically, yes. these general overhead numbers, but there they have to know where our customers are coming in, where are they paying us, and what, do we, what bills do we have. I think it's even more important for startups. I mean, it's important for everyone. Because they may have an influx of cash that's required almost every month. Absolutely. And then you have to see, is this a line of credit issue? Is it a temporary issue? Or... Do I have a business model problem? I mean, there's lots of questions that can come from that, but I think as a startup, <coughs> critically important. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to tell you, that was the accountant. Everybody with me? I just bored you to tears with the accountant portion. Now we're going to talk about the thing that I think is frankly one of the most exciting reporting advancements and developments in recent times. And I, uh, <laughs> I just classified myself as a grade A geek by calling it an exciting reporting development. Yeah, I hear that. Okay, but it is the dashboard, the scorecard, key performance indicators, KPIs, call it what you want. In a nutshell, it is a set of leading and lagging indicators that tell you how your company is doing. These are measured weekly. No one size fits all. Each company will have its unique set of indicators, but basically five to seven on a management team scorecard. No more than ten for sure. We're going to get into it. Uh, leading indicators are the equivalent of putting your foot on the gas. If you apply a little pressure here, time, money, you should see results. Lagging indicators. Okay? Are you with me on the concept? Nod. This is interactive. This is good. Thank you. Um, it's really important to put a little time here to get the right ones. Okay? And it's an iterative process. You'll do a whole bunch and then you'll see another one. This will make it right. We're going to go over this one. This is a manufacturing company. But here's, here's a nutshell of what the scorecard dashboard looks like. The first column, the who. Very important. Who's responsible for this? Here's the thing about that. It's transparent, right? Accountable. Everybody knows who's responsible for what. And then the what. What do they have? And then the goal. This is the most critical part because if you don't know where you want to go, you don't know what it is. And you don't want the goal changing every other day because your employees won't know what to make of it. So let's take, we measure this weekly. I, did I mention that? Every single week you have to look at this. Monthly is too late. The thing here is those leading indicators will tell you how much cash you're likely to generate down the, down the road. And if you don't like what you're seeing, you can change it before the cash is already done. You can't change what you sold last month. You can't set, change the widgets that you made three months ago. It's done. These are leading indicators. So let's take this. Shipments, clearly a lagging indicator, right? They're what went out the door. Backlog, one can argue it's a lagging indicator or a leading indicator. It's a leading indicator to shipments. It's a lagging indicator to quotes out the door. Now, in our scenario, if we know we need $250,000 in shipments out the door to meet our annual goal, what feeds that? Quotes. And our close ratio is maybe 50% in this scenario. We need $500,000 in quotes out the door every week. Are you on track or off track? That's all you need to ask the management team or the people responsible for these. If you're on track, go with God. We don't need to talk about why you're on track. But if you're off track, what's going on? Maybe the salesman has lost that love and feeling. Maybe the Knicks were in the playoffs. Maybe engineering was so busy putting out fires from client X that it didn't have time to get the information to the salesperson so he could get the quotes out the door at the right time. Well, that is something that we as an organization need to deal with. And we as an organization understand competing priorities, scarce resources. Is client X fire putting out an anomaly? Or are we always putting out fires from client X? Because we know if it continually happens, we're not going to hit our goals. It will catch up with us. So we can stop it at the leading indicator. Now, we use this religiously in our organization. We have a management team scorecard, an operation team scorecard, and a salesperson scorecard. Because as the president of the organization, 
I, I got to tell you, I don't really want to know or I don't really even care how many cold calls one of my salespeople had to make or how many networking appoint, you know, events they had to go on. Too much information. I want to know how many sales calls they went on. I want to know how many new business they sold. That's it. But as if I put on my sales manager hat, now I care very much how many, say, how many cold calls they needed to do. I care very much how many networking meetings they needed to go on. Because that, I want to know if it's working. If I put a little more pressure or time or money, if I invest another salesperson, what do I need to invest money and training in for them to do to get the results I want? This is where it's super powerful for even a soloist to be doing this. So this is a sample sales dashboard. How many dials, did, and this is, you know, this is illustrated, but how many dials? And this is, frankly, this is one of our numbers are changed, but this is one of our salesperson scorecards. How many dials? How many conversations from those dials? How many meetings did they set from those dials? How many sales appointments did they keep? Meet, sales appointments set, sales appointment kept. If any of your sales people in the room know those are two very different numbers. And then how many meetings, networking meetings? How many came from that? Now let's measure where it really matters, proposals. How much money did we generate in proposals from those? And how many client starts did we generate from those proposals? So we can see what is paying off. And here's the beauty of this. If you're a soloist, this will help keep you honest about where you're spending your time. If you're a small organization and you are eating what you kill, so to speak, so you are busy putting out billable hours, you have, to, you have to do the projects that you're selling, we all know that when that's good, we stop selling. But you know that that creates this in your life, in your business, and certainly in your cash. So this tells you, okay, how many, if I don't want to lose sight of that ball, how many networking meetings, whatever your, whatever your outward bound sales activity is, what do I need to be doing to do just at least the bare minimum to keep my network alive so I'm not starving, so I don't have these stop starts to my business? <coughs> Make sense? Yes. So this is super powerful. It's terrific. And frankly, if you're managing other people, um, well, this, I gotta tell you, since we instituted scorecards, I don't have any come to Jesus meetings with my staff. They know exactly the expectations, and if they haven't already self-corrected by the time we get to our meeting, they have a plan for how they're going to self-correct. How yes. often do you make adjustments to your goals? We do it annually or quarterly, depending on what we're seeing. The okay. sales team scorecard, we make we do that a little more often um, because we're trying new things. We're always implementing a new marketing process or adding one to the mix. Because when you institute them, you're kind of either depending on the age of the business and how well you know the business. Right. Absolutely. So. Now, this, the management team one, let me find out if I can do this. The management team one, this we do annually. What are our annual goals? What do we need to get to get there? But the sales team one, because we are um, we're always spaghetti testing in our sales department. We know we have some things that work all the time and those don't change, and then we have other initiatives that we're adding to the mix to see if they do. Okay, so if you're gonna do your own dashboard, here's some rules of thumb. First, the Pareto Principle is alive and well. The 80-20 rule applies here. You will get the biggest bang from your buck from a smaller number of indicators, okay? Second, Simplicity. To get to, to get to simplicity, ask yourself this. If you were on vacation somewhere, what five numbers would you want to get on your phone? Not on your iPad, not on your laptop, on your phone. To tell you how the business is running. To give you peace of mind that when you come back, everything is, everything is smooth, the, step, the steps are put in place for future growth and development, you're all fine. The idea here is you don't want to be awash in Excel documents with multiple tabs. That is not si simple. The next one is impact. How important are these numbers? So to get to that, ask yourself which systems in our organization are so critical that if they drop to nothing, our business would go out of business. So in my own organization, if billable hours drop to zero, I'm in big trouble. Our, we go out of business. I would say um, marketing activities, certainly if we have some sales things that go, are down to zero for too long, we've got trouble. 
because we've got to keep that economic engine running. So if they go to zero, now, if the answer is, if they go to zero, nothing happens, those aren't your numbers. If you're thinking, I want to know the difference between the budgeted and actual office supply expense, you're thinking too small. That's not where you want to go, okay? Think of ease of collection. If it takes you 10 hours to collect the data, you're never going to collect it, and I'm going to argue it's not going to be worth it. It's not what you want anyway. The information you should collect is going to be simple. I'm also going to tell you that it doesn't have to be exact. I mean, really, if we have, if the goal is 50 calls and he makes 52 or 48, do I really care? I want the trend. I want to make sure the general gist is there. So even if you get almost right data, close enough data, that's all that matters. Don't spend that extra two hours to get exactly perfect data, because it doesn't matter in the end. This is a level of generalized accountability. Okay? And then, if you have a company with departments, generally speaking, consider departmental scorecards, or on your management team scorecard, having each department have one of the numbers in there. Okay. Cash flow forecast, dashboard, I guarantee if you implement these, you will get farther and faster. No question about it. Um, if you want any of these on Excel, uh, simply email me. I will hand you, I will email you the actual Excel documents. And on the bottom of your handouts right now, you've got our URL. It's just Stephanie at I will go keeping in CFO services. Comments, questions, scathing rebuttals, cries of heresy, anything like that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Good. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.